Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the second annual Wallabaloo Conference on Mastering Computer Languages. I hope you all had a good trip. Before we get underway with today's program, let me fill you in as to what's on tap for tomorrow, Sunday, February 19th. At 9 a.m., right here in the main hall, we'll be hearing a lecture from Dr. John Smith about Computer as Teacher. Professor Smith from the University of Melbourne is a world class expert in the field of computer assisted education, and his talk promises to be both stimulating and informative. Immediately afterwards, at 10 30, there will be a presentation of papers by various delegates. That, however, will take place in the garden room on the ground floor. If you don't yet know, the garden room is also called the ballroom and will be gathering at the west end, the slightly raised area called level two. Just look for the crowd. If you get lost, there are signs in the foyer. After all that thinking, talking, and listening, I expect everyone will be a bit weary. So at 11 15, there will be a break for coffee, cookies, and other light refreshments. These will be available at the aptly named refreshment stand, placed by the door back here in the main hall. Also, if you choose to skip the formal lunch, you can buy a packed lunch at the stand for a reasonable price. I strongly urge you, however, to join us at the formal lunch. That won't be till one o'clock sharp, so you have time to stroll about town a bit. We'll be eating at the Sea View restaurant. The restaurant is located right here in the hotel on the top floor. It's a good dozen flights of stairs, so I suggest you take the lift on the ground floor, eh? If you're not fond of fish, there's an all you can eat barbecue available as well. They even offer wallaby meat. After lunch, we'll troop back downstairs to level two in the ballroom for the presentation of further papers, which will begin at 2 p.m. Please try to be on time. I know you'll be a bit tired after lunch, but the ballroom echoes so with people coming in late. Thank you in advance. Once we've heard the papers, we'll break for afternoon tea at 3 10 pm. No need to walk. The manager of the refreshment stand has graciously agreed to have tea served in the ballroom. He's even promised us some special scones, baked from a recipe of his dear old Scottish grandmother. Then, tea being drunk and scones munched, we'll retire here to the main hall for some closing remarks and questions. So, by five o'clock, we should have the conference wrapped up. But the fun isn't over. This is Australia, mates. We'll be flocking to the hotel's own Palm Lounge on the east side of the foyer for an informal reception. You can relax, mingle with the other delegates, and let your hair down a bit. This will run from 5 10 to 6 10, though you're free to stay as long as you like. The lounge manager has informed me that for the duration of the actual reception, you can have all you can drink beer for $20 with purchase of an advance ticket. And yes, tickets can be purchased from any conference organizer or at the front desk anytime between now and the start of the reception. I suggest you come by tomorrow evening to pick up the tickets, since the conference hall only holds 800 people. That way, you can also get your journey planned ahead of time and be sure not to miss this truly memorable conference. If you want cocktails, however, I'm sorry, you'll have to pay for those at the regular price. Oh my goodness! Speaking of paying, I see I forgot to tell you a couple of things. The first is about lunch. The charge for the lunch will be $15 for all you delegates. If you have guests with you, the cost is $25 for the general public and $6.50 for children under the age of 10. That's $15 each, not total for everyone. Another item is about the lunch menu. I very much urge you to try the fish. I mean, look at the restaurant's name, the Sea View. As the name suggests, it is a famous seafood restaurant. The chef is a Basque from Spain, and he really gets quite put out when people ignore his fish specialities for burgers or barbecue. If fish isn't your thing, though, try the steak. He makes an exquisite filet mignon topped with blue cheese and mushrooms. Finally, if you'd like to buy a ticket, you can have both lunch and unlimited beer for $35. I should have mentioned that earlier, but I am a bit forgetful. Maybe I should avoid the beer after the conference, eh? 
Well, I've said my bit. Are there any questions? Continuing our broadcast of public service announcements, Worldwide Helpers announces upcoming vacancies for a number of volunteer worker positions. All applicants must meet the following requirements. First of all, applicants must be over 18 years of age. The company apologises, but there can be no exceptions to this rule. Second, persons interested in these positions may not have police records. Minor traffic offences like a parking ticket are, of course, no problem. But, and I quote, past and present drug users and sex offenders need not apply. The employer will, of course, check with the police to verify your clean record. In addition, applicants must supply references from past or present employers or teachers along with their recent CV. These references must testify as to the applicant's work habits and or character. Remember, these are references from employers or teachers. A note from your dear old mum won't do. Worldwide Helpers assures me that they will contact these references to confirm they are genuine. Although all positions are volunteer, the employer will reimburse some of your expenses. For example, they will pay for transportation to and from the job site. Aside from that, the cost of phone calls is covered. As for the positions themselves, there are three types. The first involves assisting persons confined to wheelchairs. For this position, volunteers must be physically fit and in excellent health. They must be able to lift at least 150 pounds. They should also have a current first aid certificate from the Red Cross. But the most important requirement is that the volunteer must have his own car. On Tuesday afternoons, the volunteers take their clients to various scenic spots around the city to experience and enjoy nature. If you don't drive, but you'd still like to get involved, the centre has a number of openings for people to read to the blind. Readers must, of course, read English clearly. Persons with no foreign accent are preferred. For these positions, you must be available on Monday mornings. Oh, wait, I see a note here. There is one opening for someone who can read Urdu. Apparently, there is a Pakistani blind person who'd like to hear his or her native language. But the other positions are all in English. And finally, there are a limited number of volunteers needed to care for disabled children. I'm sorry, but the information I've been given does not say how many children or what disabilities they have. In any case, you are needed to care for the children for one week in August. Apparently, this will be at the close of the summer holiday. I would guess this involves helping them with the routine chores of daily life. Again, volunteers for this position must know basic first aid, be in good health and be able to lift up to 75 pounds. All applications for this position have to be submitted no later than Monday, August 8th. Applications may be made either by regular postal service, the snail mail, or by email. The mailing address is Worldwide Helpers, Post Office Box 651, East Surrey, BY8 99C. Please write, Attention, Mary Smith, on the envelope. Or you can send email to acrawfor at worldwidehelpers.org. That's acrawfor at worldwide. H E L P E R S dot org. So get out there and do something good. Okay, our next announcement is looking for someone to facilitate tiger breeding at the London Zoo. And get this, it's a strictly volunteer position. That means you don't get paid. <laughs> oh my god, <laughs> I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen, but I just have to laugh. Hello everyone and welcome to the University of New South Wales. The first thing I'd like to do at today's orientation session is get you all oriented. That means tell you the location of some useful facilities and services. So first of all, take out the maps we gave you all as you came in the door. The map is the big yellow sheet of paper. 
as you can see on the map, north is at the top, south at the bottom, etc. Which way is north? Well, look through that window on my left, your right. See the rising sun? That would have to be east. So north must be directly behind me. Now we're at the campus main gate. The recreational facilities are on my right hand and its opposite is the student centre. No questions? Good. Pretty easy, right? OK. Did everyone eat breakfast at the student food service this morning? Was the food good? Yes, yes, I am joking. I've eaten there too. So, after a meal like that, you must be eager to go to a doctor, right? <laughs> well, I have good news for you. The Student Health Centre is located about half a kilometre straight north of here. Look on your maps. You see the street on the east side of this building? Ned Kelly Avenue? Just follow that about 500 metres and the health centre will be on your left at the third cross street. Now, I know you all just got here, so you must be wondering how to tell your folks you've arrived safely, how much you miss the dog and how you already need more money. If you don't have an iPhone, you probably are wondering where to find a computer. Well, I have good news. If you go straight out of its door and walk down the garden street, you'll see the internet unit on your left side, just next to the gym. The hours are posted on the door and the computers are free, but you must bring your student ID card with you. Like I tell everyone, if you need help with anything, you can probably find right here in the student centre. Do you see the four buildings there between the student centre and the library? Those are the dormitories. The men's dorms are the two on the south, the women's the two on the north. OK, I'm sorry to have to tell you, but the university has been doing a lot of repairs and remodelling and it's not all done yet. So there may be some small problems with your dorm rooms. Maybe the window doesn't open. Maybe an air conditioner is missing or does not work. If there are any problems, you can go to the complaint office, which is right beside the teaching building between the Parker Street and the Cramer Street. Just tell them your problem and they should have it fixed by the time you graduate in four years. I'm joking, but please be patient. There are a lot of little things they need to take care of. Tired of the school food? No? Give it a week. Or maybe you just need a place to get coffee in the wee hours of the night during one of those marathon study sessions. Either way, you definitely have to check out the little cafe just past the women's dormitories. They've got free Wi-Fi, so a lot of students saddle up with coffee and a bagel for hours on end to get work done. As for the dorm rooms, I have some bad news and some good news. The bad news is the rooms are small and you'll probably be sharing space with at least three other students. The good news is that each room has its own bathroom. What's good about sharing a bathroom with three strangers? Hmm, good question. OK, call it bad news and worse news. Hey, maybe try this for good news. Each dorm has a kitchen. If you want to make snacks or meals, you can do it there. You can buy food containers at any campus convenience store so you can store your food in the kitchen. But a word of warning, you should definitely write your name on your food containers. Sad to say, there are food thieves among your fellow students. Speaking of thieves, a word about security. I mean, this is Australia and we do get drunken bush rangers wandering onto campus. Each of you will be given a key for your dorm room. Don't lose it. You have to pay for any replacement and fill out a bunch of papers too. Red tape, huh? Your key does not work for the front door of your dorm, however. To the right of each door, there's a keypad with numbers. When you move in, they will tell you the code you use to enter the door. Please do not tell the code to people who do not live in the dorm. Let's see, have I forgotten anything? Oh yes, most of you are not rich, correct? So when your clothes get dirty, you can't just throw them away and buy new ones. That means you have to learn to do laundry. 
or men, that means you have to hurry up and get married. If you decide to wash those clothes and not get married, there are laundries in each dorm. Where? Oh, I almost forgot to tell you. The laundry for each dorm is in the basement. Some real good news this time if you're a student, it is free. You do have to buy your own soap, however. The laundry closes, by the by, at 11.30. And now that I've mentioned 11.30, please remember, the dorm doors are locked at 11.30 p.m. Your code will not work. If you want to get in, you'll have to call the night watchman. Don't worry, you can get that number at the dorm office. Yes, the dorm office and the complaint office are the same office. All right then, before we continue, are there any questions? Welcome everyone to today's seminar on CV and interview skills. Remember, your CV is probably the most important document you will ever write. It opens the door to your career, and that job interview is probably the most important meeting you will ever attend. It's like stepping through that open door. So let's roll up our sleeves and get down to work, shall we? First of all, I cannot possibly tell you everything you need to know about writing a resume in the time we have, but let me tell you that there are dozens of great websites on the internet. These will give you all the suggestions you need. If you look at the paper I gave you, you will see a list of the dozen most popular sites. I can mention a couple of important points, however. One is that your CV or resume should not be too long. A page is about right. Why? HR departments do not have the time to read long documents. Too many people are sending too many CVs. After all, the economic crisis of 2008 is still very much alive. Everyone needs a job now. No matter how short you make that resume, though, you do not want to forget to tell HR how to contact your references. References are people who will give you a recommendation for a job. That's usually an ex-boss or a professor who knows you well. Do not use relatives. I don't care how much your mum loves you. Also, when you send that CV, be sure to include a typed cover letter. A cover letter is a letter where you basically are asking for a job. It's like introducing yourself. Make it brief. The real information about you is on that CV of yours. And please, make sure the letter is typed. It doesn't matter if your handwriting is beautiful or not. Companies only read typed letters. Another point about CVs is you should try to have an attractive layout. Maybe use different type fonts or colours to highlight the information. Some people include a photo. You can find dozens of examples on the internet. Whatever layout you decide to use, however, avoid all spelling and grammar errors. I used to be an HR manager. If I saw a mistake, that CV went into the garbage. Something you write in a CV is a description of your skills and experiences in an interesting way. Mention training, too. I mean, these are what get you hired. Do not just say, I have lots of experience, or I have many skills. Tell that boss what you did, for what company, and when. Better, tell him how well you did it. Don't just say, I sold houses. Say, I sold two million pounds worth of houses in my first year. That is, say something to make the person reading excited and curious. Finally, speaking of CVs, it's sad, but some people actually forget to provide a contact number. That's pretty silly. You wrote a great CV, you have HR dying to meet you, and they don't know how. You forgot your phone number. Oh sure, if you apply online, they have your email address, but you just showed them you're forgetful. Why are they going to want to talk to you after that? Alright, moving on to the actual interview. I'll go over what you need to know by the end of it, and what you can discuss and negotiate on later once it looks like you'll be offered the job. First, there's working hours. It's not that necessary to hammer out the hours off the bat, especially since it's easy to come off as lazy when the first thing you bring up is how much you're going to have to work. You can also find out more about possible promotions later on. 
It is important, however, to get a feel for how much you'll be paid. You should make sure the salary range is commensurate with what you're worth, and if you're not, you can move on to better opportunities. Being sure you're going to make what you want to live on is much more important than issues like your pension. You're all so young that your pension is not going to matter for quite a long time. You should find out about what skills you must know for the job and what they'll teach you. In addition, if the company will provide training, you should find out how long the training period is and whether it is paid. Beware of any jobs that want you to train for a long time without appropriate compensation. Speaking of compensation, find out about holidays as well. Do you get paid vacation time? Are you allowed to take personal days? Do you have to work on national holidays? Once you work out these main issues, you can move on later to details like the location and expected attire and whatnot. Wow, that's a lot of information. Let's take a break so you can think everything over and ask any questions you may have. Don't hesitate to come and see me if you need any clarification on all this stuff. Hi, folks. My name is Loretta Johnston, and I'm here from the Baltimore Department of Public Waste. Thank you for coming out to our community meeting tonight. I've got a few words to say about the waste collection here in Baltimore. First, there's the sorted collection bins themselves. They're made of sturdy solid material, so none of your trash can seep out or puncture the bin. Also, since these things sit out on the curb overnight, rain or shine, they have to be waterproof. We can't have water getting up in it and filling up the bin. Remember to pay attention to which bin is which and sort your waste accordingly. You should have a blue or green bin for recyclable garbage, a yellow bin for unrecyclable garbage, and a red bin for toxic waste. Our citywide waste management is divided into two services. The first is commercial waste collection or trash collection from buildings. The majority of building waste is paper, which goes in the blue or green bins. You'll notice in your office buildings there are signs that warn you not to overfill these bins. All that paper adds up, and an overflowing bin is infinitely harder for collectors to carry to the truck and empty. Aside from paper, another large source of building waste is metals. Metals such as tin and aluminium can be put in the yellow recycle bins, but metals like lead and copper should be disposed of in the red bins. These heavy metals are harmful to the environment and exacerbate our city's existing pollution problem. That's about all the information you need for building waste. Moving on to the second service, household waste collection is probably what you primarily think of when you think of what we do here. Many of the same guidelines apply. The sorting is the same, etc. Please remember to keep garbage like kitchen waste in a plastic bag. It makes collection easier and lessens the abominable rotten trash smell. So, after we take your trash away, what happens to it? We take all the garbage to one of a number of garbage disposal plants, each of which is located in the middle of an open space of some sort. No one wants to have their home or office right next door to a waste disposal plant, right? Waste is collected and then disposed of once every four weeks. A lot of trash can build up in that time, so we're in the process of developing a plan to fund collection more frequently. Ideally, it would be collected weekly, but we will likely have to settle for bi-weekly. The garbage trucks make their rounds to clear the bins at night in order to avoid traffic. I'm sure you've seen how much waste your own household produces in a given week. Now imagine all the trash produced by all the households in Baltimore. It's a lot, right? It may surprise you that this amount is only marginal compared to commercial waste. Yep, the main waste producers are actually businesses, industrial facilities, retail and offices. Hard to believe humans produce that much waste, right? No wonder we have pollution problems. Anyway, after all incoming waste is sorted, recyclables are sent to a recycling plant, while garbage and toxic waste are transported to their respective areas of the plant for treatment. Items such as stones, which should not be disposed of in our bins, are separated out and discarded. Once the trash has undergone the treatment process, it is compacted and disposed of with all the other trash. 
And finally, when the landfill space is full, it is buried deep underground, and in time, something new is built on the land. That's everything about waste collection. Thank you for listening. Are there any questions? Hi everyone and welcome to Sydney Airport. Today I'll be giving you the inside information on the day-to-day -day operations of the Australian Quarantine Service here. We hope to provide you with a better understanding of why such heavy security regulations are necessary by educating you on how we operate and why we do the things we do. We're not here to try to persuade you to fly through Sydney Airport, though we hope you'll find your experience relatively stress-free and comfortable. First things first, our personnel. Can anyone guess how many people work at Sydney Airport? We have 200 alone working in Terminal 2. So can you guess how many in the whole airport? I heard someone say 360. That's getting closer. What? Did someone say 2,000? That's way too high. Sydney Airport actually employs 440 people. A lot, right? and about half of those employees work in security-related matters. Moving on to our not-so-human employees, let's come and see our favourite pooch, Milton. Milton is our best drug-sniffing dog on the force. He's friendly to most people. You can even come pet him at the end of our tour. Burnouts, beware though, he'll find everything. Notice that even though there are so many of us around him, Milton stays quite calm. This is the precise reason he was chosen for the job. Dogs that are chosen are not predisposed to sniff out different narcotics. That's something we teach them already. So here's a part of the airport most people never notice, the cargo transport terminal. This is where packages are shipped to and from. Normally, we ship around 4,400 packages per month. In this airport alone, over 52,000 packages were shipped in and out over the past year. We ship to and from 170 different countries. Not bad, eh? Probably it will go up to over 72,000 packages this year. And despite over 100 flights in and out of here daily, the number of lost or delayed packages is impressively low. If you send your package through here, rest assured, we'll get it where it's going. Let's move on to the area most of us are familiar with, the passenger terminals. In order to be allowed into this area, you must pass through security with your ticket and, if you're travelling internationally, your passport. If you're travelling domestically, you just need a legal form of ID. If you don't have those, you will not be allowed to pass through security and board your flight. During the security scan, your carry-on items will be checked for dangerous items such as weapons, sharp objects and liquids that exceed our specified limit. If you attempt to pass any of the prohibited items on this list posted at the entrance, you are still allowed to board the plane, but you'll be given a warning and your item will be confiscated. Don't worry, we will not arrest you for having too much shampoo in your bag or anything like that. We also search your carry-ons and parcels for any perishable items. We prohibit the transportation of local vegetation and prohibit parcels containing any insects in them. You may or may not have learnt about this in biology class, but when some plants are introduced to a new environment, they spread wildly and wipe out the current species around it. It is important to control the introduction of new plants into an ecosystem, so we must prohibit the transport of any fertile seeds. So what happens to parcels containing possibly suspicious items? It's of course something we do not take lightly here. If an object passes through the scanner that appears suspicious in any way, it is separated out for manual search by a member of our trained security personnel. If an illegal plant or simple sharp object like a pocket knife is found, it is simply disposed of in our biohazard waste containers and the package itself is returned to the sender, or passenger, if it is for a passenger flight. More serious weapons are reported to higher authorities for investigation. As far as parcel security, the material of the parcel is important. For shipped goods, the most common material used and the most widely accepted is paper. Make sure it is packed sturdy enough with no rips or tears, We've definitely had packages rip open before due to haphazard packing. A more common problem, though, is the package labels. 
When an item does not make it to the right place, this is the most common reason. The label may not be in the right place or marked clearly enough. If you're receiving any items from abroad that must be declared, please remember our guidelines in order to ensure the timely delivery of your item. Make sure it is packed correctly, and we ask that you notify customs between two and ten days within the item's scheduled arrival date. Okay, before we move on, are there any questions? Thank you all for coming to our community meeting. As you know, we're excited to unveil our improvement plan as we look forward to the influx of tourists in the summer months. I'll start with a quick overview of the main points of interest in the area for anyone who may not quite know his or her way around yet, and then I'll get to the improvements made. First off is my favourite, the Science Museum, which is on the corner of St George Road. If you have not visited yet, I encourage you to go before the busy season. It is absolutely spectacular. There is even a flight simulator you can try out. Just west of the Science Museum is the National History Museum. It's a sight not to be missed as well, with each floor devoted to a different era in our nation's history. There are special exhibits for children with interactive games and fun history lessons too. If you're looking for parking, it is available on the intersection of Queen Street and South King Street in the car park. Standard hourly and daily rates do apply. The best place for souvenirs is the shopping mall, though it gets extremely busy during peak times. You can get there from the Tube or the entrance on Timber Road, just south of Cornwell Road. This area has students everywhere, usually from the primary school across the street from the shopping mall. Classes often take field trips and engage in guided tours through the area. So that's the overview of the main sites, and hopefully by now I've given you a general idea of the area. Now I'm going to outline the improvements we have made in our efforts to make the experience even better for each and every one of our visitors. You probably noticed when you first drove into the car park this morning that there is now additional signage to help avoid confusion. The directions were not entirely clear at first, so we have increased the number of one-way signs indicating the correct direction of traffic flow. Not far from there, in line with our mission of giving back to the community, we constructed a brand new playground for the primary school. It is really something to be excited for. The equipment is state-of-the-art and includes swings, a small climbing wall and even an obstacle course. Now we'll head north and take a look at the Science Museum. In response to our feedback from past visitors to the museum, there is now free information available outlining not only upcoming IMAX showings, but also natural wonders like meteor showers, eclipses and other cool natural events. The Science Museum isn't the only museum improving the experience of its visitors. The National History Museum has added an entire new wing to its facility to accommodate the large crowds of people gathering to see the Civil War exhibit, Inventions Timeline exhibit and other wonderful sections of the museum. The increase in space will definitely give a more calm, comfortable experience for visitors. And finally, remember when there was actually a line at the mall entrance from the tube station? It was terrible trying to get anywhere from the tube because foot traffic got so backed up sometimes. We have addressed that by adding another entry point into the mall from the other end of the platform to disperse the crowd. So those are the major improvements we have made. Clearly having too many people that want to visit and enjoy what our community has to offer the public is a good problem to have and I am confident that we have made the changes necessary to accommodate the growing interest in the area. As always, we welcome any questions, comments or concerns about the new improvement plan. In a few minutes I will open up the floor for questions, but you can also contact me or any other board member by email or through the City website. Thank you for coming, and I now encourage you to stay for the questions and answers panel occurring between now and 10.30. Good evening, I'm Geoffrey Miller, 
from the University of Nottingham Student Union. And in this week's free class, Carlos Garcia is going to tell us about safety around campus. Over to you, Carlos. Thank you, Geoffrey, and thank you all for your attendance today. Also, I'd like to thank the Student Union here at the University for organising this lecture. Well, I've been serving and protecting the City of Nottingham for over 20 years now as a member of the Police Department. Does anyone know what type of crime is the most prevalent on campus? I heard someone say drugs and alcohol. That actually isn't too much of an issue. Violence? Nope. Actually, the biggest thing we worry about here is theft. The nature of crime on Nottingham's campus is quite different from that of the surrounding areas. Crime rates across the East Midlands are very difficult to control. We'd like to see the rates stay the same for this calendar year, but it has been increasing steadily over the past three years. On campus, however, I'm happy to say that the overall crime rate has fallen this year. You wouldn't think so if you've seen the extremely exaggerated stories in the media. The media has done nothing but cause more concern about crime in our area. Even the crime shows you see today are a little bit far-fetched, but at least viewers know they're not real events. We'd really like to see more factual news articles out there so the public can have a rational sense of the safety level of our society. OK. Let's move on to what to do when you see a crime. Do not get involved, if at all possible, and do not draw too much attention to yourself by running away in a conspicuous manner. Though most likely, and hopefully, you will not have to experience this situation, if you are being mugged, please do not try to resist. Instead, be compliant and seek help after the incident. Like I said, though, it is highly unlikely that you will find yourself amidst a crime, but it is important to be prepared should it ever happen. We find that educating students and staff on the correct precautions to take is the best way to increase your safety. Just remember to be smart when you're out late at night and avoid any area or person that looks suspicious. I know it sounds obvious, but I cannot stress this enough. It's also not a bad idea to have your mobile phone with you at all times, but be careful. If you're chatting on your smartphone on your way home, you're a prime target for thieves. I'd like to see a show of hands. How many people have left work or the library after 10 p.m. to go home before? A lot of you, right? If you do have to go home late at night, please don't walk home alone. More often than not, there's someone there that will be walking the same direction as you at some point. Walk home with a friend or co-worker, even if you must use your phone to call someone that's nearby to walk with you. It's always safer to walk home with someone. So when you're walking home, you may feel more comfortable with some sort of self-defense, such as pepper spray. Now. It's your call whether you want to carry something like this or not. However, I absolutely advise against carrying a knife or any other offensive weapon. All too often, they can be used against you if you're disarmed, putting yourself in more danger. For all those interested, the Recreation Centre offers a free self-defence class to all students every Thursday evening. While obviously an introductory self-defence class may not equip you to fight off villains like a regular superhero, it does come in handy sometimes. After taking a self-defence class, you'll surely be more aware of possible dangers and how to deal with them. So hopefully now you have a more complete understanding of the nature of crimes committed on your campus and how to avoid being a victim. I know most students at the University of Nottingham are not the criminal types, but remember that there is no barrier like a wall or something keeping non-students out. There's no army force securing the borders and I doubt anyone wants it that way. The campus is generally a safe place but it's not immune to small crimes once in a while. All right, that's all I have to say for today. Stay safe. Hi, Mark. Hi, Gina. What can I help you with? So we were hoping you could help us with this extracurricular project. Sure. What is the topic? 
Attending business school. This sounds like a great idea. So you're going to explain the requirements for getting into business school? Not exactly. It will be more broadly about the experience, the academics, accommodation, and social experience that comes with being part of the business school. I see. So would your audience be the general public? Well, we would probably want more to focus on members of the institution. We would especially like to reach individual applicants to the business school. I see. Now, what form will this information be? You could give a talk to all the summer courses. All you'd need is permission from the course director, or you could pass out information outside the student union. Those are both good ideas. What about sending out pamphlets in the mail? Most college students never check their mail. Maybe you could make a video and show it on campus. That's a great idea. We'll do the video. Great. And as members of the business school, do you have an incentive to attract new students? If so, this idea is a great way to do that. No, the idea actually came about because of how much students like us worry about their studies. Yeah, when I got into business school, there were a lot of things I had not prepared for, so the video would cover a lot of things Mark and I wish we had known upon entering business school. Right. What would you talk about first? The first and probably most important section would be academics. Good idea. So, would you provide guidance on what courses to take? We want to focus especially on the approaches professors take, their teaching methods. It is far different than what students are used to in high school and even in liberal arts college. Good idea. And how long do you think you would spend explaining academics? We'll probably spend seven minutes on it. We also have some ideas for talking about housing, food options, and stuff like that. We're not really sure how to tie it all together, though. I think it would be suitable to title that section "Accommodation." What do you think? That could work. We'll definitely describe the different dining options at the cafeteria, and then walk students through flats and the grueling process of finding one near the business school campus. Okay, so we would cover specifics on the cafeteria as well as flats. I think those are both helpful. We could spend about six minutes on accommodation, and be sure to touch on those specifically. Great. Is there anything else you would talk about? We definitely want to go over the social aspect of attending school here. Of course, I think it's good to have a little fun once in a while when you're working so hard in school. I think we are going to introduce new students to the disco that so many upper class men know and love. Maybe we'll include a few other places too, but that's the main one. We're also going to invite students to the international evening taking place in the first week of school as a great chance for our large international student population to meet a lot of other new students. It can definitely be hard to meet people as an international student. I think that is a great idea. You may want to spend slightly longer on this section than the other two. Hmm. How about eight minutes? That sounds reasonable. So overall, the introduction should take three minutes, and then the conclusion should take four, giving us a total of twenty-eight minutes. I wouldn't rush your introduction. Maybe give it between four and six minutes. The conclusion, though, can be shorter. Since it's just a quick refresher of each of the topics, give that not more than two minutes. Okay, so in total, the video should take about the same time, just more intro and less conclusion. Precisely. All right, we're going to get to work on our video. Thanks for your help. Welcome to all of you. Can everybody see and hear me? Good. I'm Sarah Connor, an HR representative of Earn and Learn. I have been asked today to talk to you about our company. So, for those of you who don't know very much about the company, let me start by giving you some basic information about it. Earn and Learn started nearly 20 years ago. It is not a charity, but a for-profit company that enables promising entrepreneurs to make money while traveling. During the past 10 years, it has grown rapidly. And has gained great influence in most countries of the world. We have a partnership with the school and take a large number of recent graduates from the business school. So, if you are a recent graduate, I'd say you can consider applying to our company. 
Before your application, you might be curious about what sort of places you could go to. There are four main locations, but you also have the freedom to submit a different location, and if they can make the necessary arrangements, you can go. The first country Earn and Learn established locations was the US, where you may choose from multiple locations, as long as you can commit to their more rigid schedule of August to December. Also, you could do the Australia internship. That one is really cool. You work at a wildlife shelter and learn about the business practices of non-profit organisations. You do have to be willing to commit eight months for that one though. Perhaps that's a long time to be so far away, but I would say it is really an amazing opportunity. I don't know whether some of you are in decent physical shape. If so, the South Africa internship is another exciting one. You learn a lot about sustainable farming, but you would be doing some of the manual labour involved in maintaining a farm. Indeed, it's hard work, but I think you would definitely be able to do it. It may be wise to wait until after their summer is over, so it's not so terribly hot. In addition, there is a most recently established location in India. This one gives you more of a study abroad feel, given that they arrange a host family for you to stay with. In the other locations, you live in an apartment with other interns, so this is definitely a unique experience. Regardless of where you go, at the end of the program you get a global travelling certificate, as long as you can explain your experience. You can provide a written log of what you did. I recommend writing journal or blog entries about what you do every day, or a weekly summary of each day. Of course, you don't have to write up a formal report or anything like that, and you need to apply for it once you have returned. Some students may want to know whether this is a paid internship. Actually, you have to pay for the flight there yourself. But you have the opportunity to create your own small business, which could earn you money if it's successful. So basically, you pay for it all up front, but when you're there, you can find ways to make money. That is to say, you pay for two-thirds of the cost up front as a deposit, and then give the final instalment one month prior to your return. Finally, I have to remind you that you need a health check before you go, to make sure you're not going to spread any communicable diseases. In addition, before you go, you don't have to attend any meetings or workshops. You'll meet everyone you'll be working with once you get there. OK, well, that's all I've time for today. Thanks for listening, and I'm happy to take any questions if you have them. Hey, if you're just joining us on WKPX The Sound, welcome. We're here in the studio with Matt and Cam in the morning, and this morning we're talking about keeping the kids occupied on summer vacation. Folks, there's a new kid in town in the world of summer fun. Get ready for the Pool of the People, a pool and outdoor venue created by, that's right, the people. Scheduled to open in November, the ideas for everything from the design of the pool right down to the items sold in the snack bar have been decided upon by a sample of 1,050 members of the public. The public selected two top proposals from over a dozen created by renowned architect Ned Mosby, and the final design is truly something else. The pool is shaped like a fishbowl, sinking down into the ground, and there's, you guessed it, a real live fish tank in the center. It's certainly the center of attention in the Bridgewater area. Now, you are probably wondering how much an extravagance like this must cost, right? Well, have no fear. At just £15 for adults and £10 for kids, it's an affordable way to entertain the kids in those dog days of summer. The only problem now is the possibility that it will in fact become too popular. The pool is only so large, so swarms of people coming to enjoy it may cause quite a crowd in its first summer of opening. There will be an opening party for a select audience, and in line with the pool's mission, the people have decided on all the arrangements. They collectively decided on actress Rebel Wilson to host in the festivities scheduled for later this month, and even dictated the playlist 
by ranking their top 10 songs from a list of hundreds. There is some discrepancy, however, on the sculpture design for the foyer at the entrance. The people elected a jellyfish sculpture to greet entering visitors, but given last week's vicious attack by a box jellyfish on a local youth, coordinators fear it will bring too much fear to patrons. The theme of the clubhouse is set to be International Waters, with a different section representing each continent, designed by the legendary local artist Roberta Anuzzi. Representing Asia in the reception area will be a mosaic made up of prominent animals indigenous to the continent, a camel, a panda, and the Siberian white tiger, to name just a few. In the West Lounge, feel the cool, icy vibes of the transantarctic mountains of Antarctica. Makes you cold just thinking about it, doesn't it? Just seeing a wall with a mural of the glacial mountains is almost enough to cool you off on a December afternoon. Almost. Why not make the trip to the pool a social studies lesson at the same time? The theme in the ladies' lounge room for Africa may not be what you expected. A safari? Drum music? The Nile River? No. Did you know that Africa was home to the first jewellery? I sure didn't. By contrast, as you may expect, North America's theme for the card room is as modern, even futuristic, as it gets. Anuzzi created for North America a sort of absurdist print, interestingly juxtaposing the moon landing of 1969 with an abstract depiction of humans living on Mars. Seems to me like an interesting commentary on the future of space exploration. And in the men's lounge room, the ancient forts of Sparta, Rome, Greece and other European civilizations fittingly exhibit the strength and combatant characteristics of these societies. Finally, the cafe and breakfast room area is an enchanting round room that draws all attention to its centre, where there is a strikingly realistic sculpture of a volcano. The delicious food may actually be only the second most exciting part of this room in comparison to the nine-foot statue complete with brightly coloured molten lava to characterise South America. Honestly, it is like a museum visiting each room of the clubhouse. Why not make the trip to the pool an educational one for the kids? We're going to take a quick commercial break here at WKPX. But we'll be back in 10 with more on what's touted to be the summer's hottest place to beat the heat. Ladies and gentlemen of Durham, start your engines. Skip Gordon here inviting you to the 11th annual Durham County Car Exhibition. That's right, it's that time of year again. Mark your calendars. The pre-opening event kicks off on the 18th and the exhibition officially opens to the public on Saturday, March the 19th. Take it from me, you won't want to miss Durham's most attended public event of the year five times running. You don't have to be a motorhead to appreciate the finest cars, both new and old, in existence today, but it helps. Be one of the 70,000 people to see everything from big rigged monster trucks to good old fashioned classic hot rods. Get your tickets now. Admission is £10 for adults and £5 for children during off-peak times and £20 for adults and £10 for children and senior citizens on weekends and for full-day passes. Come see vintage classics, bid in the auctions and even test out a few on the winner's circle racetrack. An insider tip, weekends are the exact time when all of the best attractions take place but to avoid Saturday crowds, join us this Sunday. You'll see me, Skip Gordon, and all your friends from WKXP there this Sunday at our very own booth. So stop by and say hi, and you might just win a prize of your own. A new attraction this year will be the addition of a new car category. Electricity, namely the electric car class. See displays from Toyota, Honda, and you guessed it, Tesla. Watch as the first generation of fully electric cars compete on style, ride, 
and watch the main entertainment as there's going to be a fabulous show of racing car to see who takes home fastest battery powered car. While not typically known for their speed, this new class is guaranteed to surprise you. Get tickets before they sell out. Last year's tickets sold out fast, so we upped the attendance this year. That's right, more seats. But don't wait. Act now and save. That's right, if you buy your tickets before this Friday, you'll get two for the price of one. That's right, two for the price of one. And don't worry kids, just like last year, there's something specially for you. Wreak havoc on the road with the kids' crazy cars ride, and then race around the tiny tykes track in your favorite child-sized race car. Meanwhile, mom and dad can take a spin in a ride a bit more than their size. We're rolling out a massive dirt track so you can get behind the wheel and test drive something a little more adventurous. Put the pedal to the metal in a 4x4 SUV as you go over bumps and navigate through twists and turns. You'll want to buckle up. You heard it here. Act now to get in on the fun at the Durham County Car Show before it's too late. Come for prizes. Good prices and good old-fashioned family fun. We had a lucky draw for a new car last year, but this year our main event is the Monster Truck Rally, where one lucky fan will win a chance experience the thrill from behind the wheel, well, next to the wheel, as they ride with legendary driver Smash Tate, feel the speed firsthand, and talk to a living legend in a true once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. For tickets, go online to www.durhamcountycars.com or call 1-888-CAR-SHOW now. We'll see you there, and always remember to buckle up. Barter Online UK is a young, up-and-coming website in the United Kingdom where users can buy new and used goods. However, instead of paying with money, Registered users instead exchange their purchase for an item of similar value. This part is perhaps the most complicated, as the registered users themselves must mutually decide on an appropriate value, with value either being the recommended retail price, RRP, or simply how much they believe the item to be worth. The website has been founded by a group of four friends in the north of England. Originally, they exchanged their belongings among family members. They frequently found themselves swapping their belongings when they no longer had any use for them. They live by the motto, one person's trash is another person's treasure, and hate to throw things away. As more and more people caught wind of the idea, and wanted to participate in the exchanges, the group decided that the idea had the potential to become a successful business venture, and so it did. Barter Online UK is a startup online business, which took three months to set up, and has now been running for around half a year. Despite only being founded a short time ago, the website has already garnered about 1,500 registered users, with 500 more than expected, a huge achievement for the founders. Some of the users are registered in the United Kingdom and Canada, with the majority from the Republic of Ireland. In order to become a registered member, users must first fill in their personal details, followed by their credit or debit card details which will be used to take payment of a monthly fee of £5. As long as this fee is paid, users will be able to perform an unlimited number of online exchanges. A multitude of items are sold on the website, such as textbooks, soft toys and tools. However, books for children and computer games are by far selected most. The exchange process itself is not as complicated as it might seem. Users can enter their preferences for what they would like to receive and also explicitly state what they would like to give away 
and the website will automatically pair up suitable users. If, however, a user doesn't want to give anything away, but would simply like to buy something, Barter Online UK does support a secure online payment system where users can perform a normal monetary transaction. Despite this, the founding group strongly discourages the use of the online payment system, clearly stating that this goes against the intended ethos of the company. Although bartering is an age-old process, many of the website's users are unsure how to decide which of their own items to exchange. It often helps to order items by popularity using the filter button provided. This will tell the website to find out popular items for users' convenience. To this, the founding members say, just put everything you don't want on there. Different people have different tastes, and you never know what they might be looking for. In order to aid registered users in their exchanges, and to provide them with assurance, the founders recently added a new feature, whereby on completion of an exchange, users will be encouraged to provide each other with feedback. This feedback will include criteria such as the quality of the item as compared with how it was advertised, the ease of communication with the seller, the speed at which the item was delivered, and so on. The friends believe that using this method, users will have a more transparent and trustworthy bartering experience. Hello and welcome to the homepage for the Healthy Hearing Medical Clinic and Surgery, where we'd like to share a little more information about the services we provide and more. Our hospital is one of the leading specialised hospitals in the United Kingdom, attracting the very best healthcare professionals from around the globe. Not only are we a leading medical practice, but we are also the only hospital in the United Kingdom dedicated entirely to the treatment of and research into the curing of hearing loss. Our facilities and staff here are renowned across Europe, attracting thousands of patients a year. Our consultations can number anything up to 11,000 patients a year. However, we aim to treat around 5,000 patients a year so as to maintain and ensure the quality of our services. Our patients are guaranteed the highest standard of care, as well as the use of our first-class facilities. All patients requiring overnight treatment are provided with their own private room with ensuite facilities, as well as a state-of-the-art entertainment centre, which includes a flat-screen LCD television and PlayStation. Appointments with our healthcare professionals can be made at any time during the week, with female doctors available between 8 a.m. and 11 a.m. If you need to see a doctor outside of these times, please visit the Out of Hours page of our website for more information. Our doctors are all trained to an exceptionally high standard and practice a vast array of specialities. Mr. Roberts is a fully qualified ear and throat specialist. Mr. Edwards is a pediatric hearing specialist while Mr. Green specialises in reversing hearing loss. For more details about our people, please visit the staff members page on our website. During a consultation, doctors will sometimes decide medication is required, for which patients should receive a prescription. There are several pharmacies within the city. However, we recommend that patients use the pharmacy housed within our healthcare facility. Our in-house pharmacy is well stocked at all times. Our products are competitively priced and our pharmacists are on hand to help and advise from 8am until 10pm from Monday to Saturday and from 9am until 12pm on Sundays. If you require any help outside of these hours, please see our Out of Hours page on the website. Since the Healthy Hearing Medical Clinic and Surgery also functions as a teaching hospital, we aim to provide our students with every opportunity to expose themselves to medicine in practice. Therefore, we would like to encourage our patients to give their consent 
for a medical student to attend their consultations. If our patients are not comfortable with this, there will be a form at reception where patients will be able to opt out. Now, please look at the map I've given you of the Healthy Hearing Medical Clinic and Surgery. For those not familiar with our practice, reception can be found through the main door at the end of the corridor. If your consultation is booked with Mr. Green, you need to go through the main door and turn right by the nurse's desk, and his office is at the end of the corridor on your left-hand side. If you need to alter any of your personal details, please visit our secretary at the Office for Medical Records, which you will find next to the therapy room. If you're awaiting surgery, please first check in with reception before taking the first door on the right after you enter the clinic. Finally, in the event that you feel disappointed with any of the services we have provided or have any further questions, please locate our manager's office, which can be found near the office for medical records and between two closets. If you have any more questions about the Healthy Hearing Medical Clinic and Surgery, please do not hesitate to contact us on 01256-111-111. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Mount Rushmore. To start your visit, I'm just going to give you a brief account of the history of the memorial before letting you roam about on your own. I won't keep you long, OK? Mount Rushmore is South Dakota's top tourist attraction and features the heads of four United States presidents, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Theodore Roosevelt and Abraham Lincoln. Each head is 18 metres tall, which is taller than the heights of 11 people combined. The sculptor initially wanted to depict the presidents from head to waist, but due to a lack of funding, the construction had to stop before this vision could be realised. In total, it cost the government $1 million to sculpt the heads at Mount Rushmore. Before the construction of the president's heads, the mountain was just bare rock and forest, attracting only a few hikers a year. The new carving at Mount Rushmore has become an iconic symbol of presidential greatness and has appeared in works of fiction and other popular works. The sculpture has also worked perfectly as a way to develop tourism, which was its intended purpose, and now attracts over 2 million people a year. The original plan was to carve the president's faces into the granite pillars known as the needles. However, the sculptor soon realised that these rocks were too eroded and delicate to support such a large sculpture. Instead, he chose to locate the carving at Mount Rushmore due to its grand appearance and brightly lit rock faces that experience maximum exposure to sunlight throughout the day as a result of the southeast orientation. Upon seeing Mount Rushmore, the sculptor declared, America will march along that skyline. The name of Mount Rushmore also has an interesting history. The location was originally known as the Six Grandfathers. However, during an expedition in 1885, the mountain was renamed after Charles E. Rushmore, a prominent New York lawyer who joked that his annual treks to the mountain had earned him the right to have it named after him. Forty years after the mountain was renamed, Charles E. Rushmore donated $5,000 towards the sculpting of the president's heads the largest single contribution. In 1927, the construction work started and seven years later was complete with no fatalities. So that's the history for you. If you'd like any more information, please feel free to ask me questions or you can soak up the information from our fantastic guidebook. Now I'm going to give you a plan of the site and I'd just like to point out where everything is so that you can explore everything for yourself. We're currently standing at the entrance, which is marked with the arrow on the map. If you follow the trail up to our left, you will find the information centre. 
There's a great photo booth there where you can have your photograph taken with Mount Rushmore in the background for a fee of only $10. What a great souvenir. In front of us is the refreshment centre where you can help yourselves to coffee, locally grown tea and a delicious selection of cold drinks and biscuits. Be sure to stay hydrated as it can get really hot up here. To our right, not far up the trail, is the gift shop. Here we sell copies of the guidebook and it's also the perfect place to pick up some small souvenirs for yourself, your family and friends. Now, further up the trail, behind the gift shop, is a big stone building with a workshop. This is where all of our souvenirs are made by hand, which you can purchase in the gift shop, like I said before. Some are even carved from pieces of rock taken from Mount Rushmore itself. If you carry on walking up the trail past the workshop, you'll find our state-of-the-art visitor centre, where you can find maps of the walking trails here at Mount Rushmore. Now for the real treat. After you have walked past the visitor centre, you can follow the trail up to the left, which will take you to our wooden shelter. From here, you will have the best view of Mount Rushmore that there is, an experience not be forgotten. Right, if anyone wants a guided tour, then I'm starting at the information centre. If you'd like to follow me, this way please. Thank you all for coming to my talk this evening. It's nice to see so many people in the audience. For those of you who don't know very much about Connection, let me start by giving you some background information about it. Connection is a British organisation that facilitates homestays all over the globe. This organisation prides itself on matching tens of thousands of host families with guests every single year, allowing travellers to discover a country's culture in a way like no other. Homestays are ideal for both travellers and homeowners, enabling intercultural exchanges and the development of lifelong friendships while providing travellers with often discounted accommodation costs and host families with a steady income from the comfort of their own homes. The homestay experience is particularly popular with university exchange students looking for a more genuine insight into their country of choice and an unrivaled opportunity to develop their language skills. The homestay experience is truly unique and once in a lifetime and one that you will likely remember for the rest of your lives. It is important to note, however, that some people will find it difficult to adapt to the new country, with many enduring what is known as culture shock. Connection's advice for those suffering from culture shock is to go out and make as many friends as possible, no matter how difficult you may find it. Friends are guaranteed to help you feel more integrated as part of the local society and show you some great places to hang out. At first, it might seem extremely challenging to overcome the language barrier between you and your host family. However, you will find that you quickly overcome this and develop a very close and almost familial relationship. Many of our travellers have suggested that they have found discussing their hobbies and other interests with their host families is the best way to overcome any barriers, since you are more likely to find something you share in common. For example, you might find that you are both passionate about football and end up playing in the local field every week. One of our guests undertaking a homestay in a rural area of the UK told us that she and her host now take a Tai Chi class together upon a hilltop at sunrise, calling the experience absolutely breathtaking. After the first few weeks, you will find your understanding of the people around you and their culture deepens by leaps and bounds, and you will soon become one of the locals. Our hosts in over 140 countries turn a location into a culture, time into experience and strangers into friends. 
So how can you find out about applying for a homestay? The best way would be to visit Connection's website www.connection.com and contact one of their friendly advisors for more information. Once you have confirmed your interest in the service, we would strongly advise that you remain in close contact with the registration office, which will send you several emails keeping you up to date with potential matches in your country of choice. Once registered, Connection will require you to send various documents and will act as an intermediary between you and the host family prior to final confirmation and payment. During this stage, Connection will ask you to provide two photos, one for the host family and the other for our own records. Please ensure that you sign the back of each photo. Due to the nature of the service Connection provides, security is an absolute must and they will ask you to send in photocopies of your passport, birth certificate and a bank statement as confirmation of your identity. On receipt of these documents, the official process will begin and your bank account will be debited for the initial deposit of £200. If you haven't received any acknowledgement confirming receipt of these documents from us within seven working days, please contact the main office. As I mentioned before, due to the nature of the organisation, Connection operates a meticulous screening process and all applicants will undergo an interview in our head office in London, with exceptions made in extreme circumstances. After your interview, it may take us several weeks to carry out the decision process, so please be patient with us. If you would like a fast-track service, please indicate this on your application and we will notify you of the additional charges. Finally, once we have come to a result about your application, you will receive a decision in the post. If you do not receive an offer of placement, we will refund your deposit within seven working days. Good morning, listeners, and welcome back to Star Radio. Today on the show, we have a visitor from Yazoo Car Rental who is going to give us an insight into his company and into the public transport system. Welcome, Jonathan. Thank you for having me. Yes, I would like to start by introducing my company, Yazoo Car Rental. We are the cheapest and most reliable rental company in the city and have won multiple awards for the quality of our services. This success did not come easily, however, and it proved important that we stay fresh and are always thinking of ways to attract new customers. Our first attempt to do this was to offer a free gift with every car rental, which we were confident the customers would be very interested in. The offer of a free Hoover with each rental, however, did not attract any new customers, so we quite quickly stopped offering it. In 2002, a new taxi company opened next door to us and we started losing a lot of business to them. So we introduced an offer that we hoped might compete with their service. We offered a new package where you could rent a car with a driver for a small extra fee. By introducing this offer, we found that all of our customers preferred to drive the cars themselves. So again, this offer was unsuccessful in attracting more customers. Learning from these mistakes, we decided to offer a package service where the customer no longer had to come to our offices to pick up the rental car. Instead, we could drop off and pick up the car anywhere in the city to make the customer's experience a lot more stress-free. This offer was very popular and increased our profits by 30%. In order to attract a younger demographic, we updated the models of cars that we offered for rental. We began offering more trendy cars, such as minis and smart cars, that we thought might appeal to the younger crowd, and we also purchased them in more fun colours, like reds and greens. This offer attracted some new customers of a younger age group, however, not as many as we hoped. Next, I decided to offer our services at a discounted price on our website, where it could be seen by thousands of people. 
I thought that this could be a great way to attract a number of new customers who would never have heard of us before, and it worked fantastically well. Following the success of the discount offer, we had so many customers that it became necessary to open a new branch of the company in the centre of the city. The cost of renting offices in the city centre was very high, so we hoped that our profits would justify this expensive decision. We made enough profit to keep our city centre offices open, but we had hoped for a greater increase in customer numbers. Now for the second part of my talk, which is on the topic of public transport. There are many benefits to public transport. For example, the recent introduction of bus lanes has meant that buses are now unaffected by traffic jams and are able to stay on schedule. Unfortunately, as fewer and fewer people are taking the bus nowadays, the service has become quite inefficient. This reduction in passengers may be due to the stories in the newspaper about the dangers posed to pedestrian safety by the buses. However, this is largely untrue, as buses are responsible for far less pedestrian-related accidents than cars. I use the bus service often, as car petrol is so expensive nowadays that the bus is far more affordable. However, if I am in a rush, I prefer to take a taxi, as they tend to get you to your destination very quickly, so you can remain punctual for your appointments. I also very much enjoy flying to my destinations, as the service is incredibly fast and the airports are always very easy to find. Personally, my favourite mode of transportation is the bus. Due to the lack of people using the service, I have found that the buses are never overcrowded, so there is always a seat available. They are also never dirty, as they get cleaned regularly. However, I have found that sometimes the bus can be over a half hour behind schedule, which can be very frustrating. There has been a lot of fluctuation in the price of bus tickets in the last couple of years. In the past, £1.80 for a ticket was enough to sustain the bus companies. However, as the price of fuel increased, so did the ticket prices. Now the ticket prices are declining as the bus companies try to encourage more people to use their service again. Well, that's all from me today. Thank you for listening. Good morning everybody and welcome to the Australian Wild Zoo. I would like to start by introducing you to the new features that we have added to our zoo in the recent renovation. Being the only zoo in the area, we receive thousands of visitors a year. We found that this huge footfall was too demanding for the facilities that we were able to provide. And so we decided to expand ourselves in order to give every visitor a brilliant and exciting experience. We initially intended to build a new dog walking area. However, we felt that the zoo should cater only to exotic animals. During our previous renovation, we expanded the exhibition centre, and so we felt that this time the zoo would benefit most from introducing a new batch of animals, so visitors can now see a whole range of new additions at the Australian Wild Zoo, including lions and bears. With this huge improvement to our facilities, we also found it necessary to change our regulations, which we put into action in June. We now allow visitors access to the zoo during weekdays, and as some of our newly added animals are nocturnal, guests may also now visit the animals late at night. Unfortunately, some visitors had started feeding the animals during these late night viewing times, which disrupted their feeding pattern, and as a result, we had to ban food in the viewing areas. One of our most exciting additions to the zoo is our native kangaroo, who we have named Frisbee. For a fee of just $5, visitors can have their photo taken with him and have it printed onto a selection of items such as key rings and mugs. At first, visitors were also allowed to feed Frisbee items that we provided, such as carrots and leaves. However, some guests started feeding him hamburgers and chips, so we were forced to forbid visitors from feeding him. As kangaroos are such calm animals, 
Frisbee isn't disturbed by the noises and shouting of visitors at the zoo, which has helped him to settle in at his new home very quickly. The Pie Dog Zone has been permanently closed throughout the winter period to allow the dogs to hibernate as they would in their natural habitat. We were very excited to be reopening the zone. However, unfortunately, we have been forced to close it temporarily as the result of a broken fence. Which will take about one week to fix. We were intending to renovate the zone with the other construction that we were undertaking, but unfortunately, we did not have sufficient funds. We understand that this temporary closure may disappoint our visitors, and so we have decided to offer a discounted price on our tickets for the next week. If you ask at the reception desk, they will happily direct you to the photo shop where you can purchase the ticket. The ticket will also entitle you to a 10% discount off any item in our gift shop, where we sell a range of items, including postcards and fluffy toys. Now we're currently standing at the gate, which is marked with the arrow on the map. Now, if any of you need to visit the toilets before we get started, they're right here to our left. Out to the east, just across the grass. There is the bird hide, where we have over 100 species of birds for you to watch. We even have an interactive zone where you can feed them with seed and take photographs with our parrots. What a great souvenir to remember your trip! And up the path to the north, if you look in front of you now, there is the pie dog zone. Although it is closed, if any of the dogs are playing outside, you will be able to see them through the fence. And then let's pass by the refuge. This area is a sheltered part for Brolga watchers, who can use it to spy through binoculars. And after that, I suggest that you all visit the rest area for some cold drinks and snacks, as it is very hot outside. It is just at the northwest corner of the zoo. After that, you could cut across the path to the large rectangular hut. Where you will be able to see our new edition of fierce lions. The mother has just had cubs, so it is really quite a rare thing to see. And around to the west, for those of you who want to visit Frisbee, our native kangaroo, he is in the circular-shaped hut just up the path to the left. Don't forget to have your photo taken with him. Now, as I mentioned before, you can purchase your discounted tickets at the photo shop. And this is also where you will come to collect any photos you have had taken at the zoo during your visit. The photo shop is located at the southwest corner of the zoo. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, enjoy your visit. Welcome to Byron National Park. I am Jim Carson, your tour guide for the trip. First, I'd like to give you some basic information about the park. Covering 7,000 acres of land and spanning across three states, Byron National Park was established to protect the area's most spectacular scenic values. With unique geological features, natural history, and native plant and animal life, it is an ideal destination for recreation as well as research purposes. The park has a breathtaking waterfall connecting the longest river in the country, but. It is most renowned for having the largest subtropical rainforest worldwide. There are many layers of tall, medium, and low vegetation growing with seasonal variations in the park. It is a place where the air seems green. Ardent hikers can find an awesome array of options here. Apart from the dense green rainforest, tourists can also hike along the mountain trail. Despite the stunning view. Taking photos is not advised on the way up. I'm afraid, as one might get distracted, and the narrow trail by the sheer cliff is quite dangerous. When you reach the top of the mountain, there is nothing better than having a picnic under the trees with your family. Accompanied mostly by wildlife, walkers as well as cyclists may find the bush track a good choice for having a tranquil time to themselves. As your tour guide. I suggest that only expert hikers take the creek circuit, because its beautiful and inspiring scenery through the subtropical jungle is paralleled by its physical challenges. 
A list of transport is available within the park. Bicycles are a popular choice, as it is the most flexible way to get around. Electric trams are temporarily closed for maintenance. Boat trips down the river are an ideal way to spend a tranquil afternoon. Rest assured that transport within the park is covered in the bill. Extreme sports is another highlight of the park. There are, for adventurous grown-ups, especially those who are comfortable with having a racing heart, scary as it may sound, it is actually safe to participate in extreme sports under strict instructions and close supervision. Abseiling is available regardless of the weather. It is a fun way to overcome fear of heights, gain new skills and get an adrenaline rush. Bungee jumping and paragliding are also available except for during the summer. At this point, you might worry about meals here. Well, even though there is only one restaurant in the park at the moment, the variety of dishes is astonishing. There are two meals included in the price. Just get your meal ticket at the reception before dining. Also, there is no need to make reservations or worry about availability since there are plenty of tables. During your stay here, you might want to know what there is to do. Let's turn to the plan so I can familiarize you with the layout of the park. Most tourists would choose to stay in our guest house located in the southeast corner. It features 63 tastefully appointed guest rooms, many of which offer spectacular views of the park. You'll find a home away from home at our guest house. But for those who want to experience the natural beauty up close, there is also a campsite. When you get out of the guest house, go straight ahead, turn right at the end of the road. To your left, there is a campsite amongst the trees where you could spend a night under the stars together with owls and chipmunks. If you look at the top left of the plan, you will notice a picnic area. You can either bring your own food or we can deliver food to you. Barbecue is an option. The business centre is situated directly opposite the picnic area. It provides flexible, fully serviced offices, conferencing suites, meeting rooms and is equipped with the latest multimedia facilities. Wired as well as wireless high-speed internet is available within the entire premises. The centre is designed to cater to both individual travellers and corporate groups. Visitors can also go to the museum, which holds a vast collection that exhibits local history and a natural habitat. You start from the guest house, just turn left at the first conjunction, then walk past the tea house, turn right. You'll see the museum after making the third right. Have you found it? Pretty easy, right? To spend a delightful afternoon with a book and a fresh cup of coffee, you can go to the only cafe in the park. From the guest house, you go straight, then take the second right, and you'll see the cafe right in front of you. You might want to check out our all-season tennis court, which offers instruction for all ages and skill levels. It is located right opposite the cafe. Good morning everyone and welcome to the annual Ski and Snowboard Exhibition held from April the 8th to 17th. I am Mary Granger, coordinator of the event this year. The 10-day event features many highlights. As a snow sports lover, I know you are looking forward to a great time here. Now, I'd like to offer you some practical information about the whole event and what to expect from it. This might be the first time coming here for some of you. So, for those who are still wondering about the right accommodation, I recommend Sky Hotel. It has its own health and sports clubs, just like most of the hotels here, but I love it because of its incredibly cosy beds, which guarantees good rest after an exhausting day of exploration. If you haven't brought your own equipment, like poles, boots and skis, they are available for purchase or rent at Ski Set or Snow Rental. The exhibition this year provides a colourful look into the history of skiing 
and an inspiring peek into the future prospects of the sport. Apart from the fascinating photo exhibitions and the most up-to-date skiing gear like always, this year we have added four computers which can imitate the process of skiing, ensuring the same physical activity and sensations that appear during the skiing process on downhill slopes. But I have to warn you that it might be quite time-consuming to line up for the free trial experience. Many have posed the question as to how to enter the skiing and snowboarding competition. Well, rather than filling out the back of the entrance ticket or bombarding the committee with emails, the most effective method is by checking out the exhibition newsletter delivered every month for availability. At the most beloved local event, the exhibition has also drawn attention from the press. Last year, massive media coverage was on the worrisome amount of snowfalls, in order to avoid the same predicament, several artificial skiing slopes have been built. With more participants this year, we have lowered the entrance fee, which has been widely reported to local newspapers. A bonus for our participants is the ski programme. It offers a wide variety of lessons and sessions with qualified instructors, ensuring that all ages and abilities are catered to from the first-timers to seasoned amateurs. I strongly advise you to sign up for the programme, as it is offering an unprecedented 30% discount. That's mainly because we are cooperating with the programme organiser, who promises affordable prices only for the participants of the festival this year. Now, I would like to introduce you to the list of presentations during the following week, so that you can better plan your schedule. The first presenter, Simon, is one of our best ski instructors. As an experienced instructor, he will inform you about the dangers that face skiers and snowboarders. Accidents happen mostly to those who are careless or ignorant. Good risk management involves considering both the probability and consequences of an accident. The next speech, titled Solution, is given by Jamie Kurt. A list of problems may occur to novice skiers and snowboarders, so he is going to offer useful information for first-timers on choosing the appropriate gears, the right dress code and ways of protecting your skin. For instance, some of you may have rented the skiing equipment, but rental footwear is notoriously uncomfortable. Then, Jamie will provide instructions to help make your footwear fit better. The third speech is about a documentary introducing skiing and snowboarding and the difference between the two sports. It also depicts a group of snow lovers exploring new slopes with breathtaking views. The director, Andy Fisher, will be there addressing the whole shooting experience. The fourth talk is about the tricks of skiing presented by Harry Tyson. It is most useful for those who have already tried skiing yet still need more practice to master the sport. Harry will teach you how to turn more skillfully. A lot of people can keep their skis roughly parallel, but there's no point if you make it hard to work with and slide around out of control. Useful exercises will also be suggested to improve your parallel skiing technique so that you can tackle steeper slopes and enjoy yourself more. Jason Smith will be the last presenter, mainly addressing towards advanced skiers. He manages to apply snow climbing into skiing. Climbing in soft snow, you are floundering around. Walking becomes harder, so a good trick during climbing is to maintain a wider gait, approximately shoulder width, so that you are more stable while walking. This works for skiing as well. On behalf of Northfield Sports Complex, I'd like to extend our warmest welcome to you all here this evening. I'm George Dyson, founder of Northfield Sports Complex. I am giving this speech today to celebrate a special occasion. We started the business exactly a decade ago, and today we have developed into a large firm with a sizable group of members. We've also been nominated the most valuable company by Green Town at the Yearly Business Awards, which will be held next week. As experienced and qualified reporters, you are invited here to experience and witness this historical moment of Northfield Sports Complex together with us. Situated within the campus of Greentown University, Northfield Sports Complex is a modern, refreshing and fully equipped facility for sports of all kinds. As part of its commitment to the local community, 
Northfield Sports Complex is available not only to school children but also to local residents. It offers a wide range of facilities including a 25 metre swimming pool, paved walking and jogging paths, a well-equipped fitness gym, all-weather pitches, indoor courts for table tennis, tennis and other sports, as well as a renowned skating rink. Different age groups can all find the right sports to participate in. That's why local residents enjoy working out here. As a result, natives here are healthier than most of the people within our nation. The whole town is very proud of having nurtured two world champions who were once both trained right here in our skating rink. Thus, it has become the ideal venue to learn to skate and have fun. But what I take pride in most of all is the skating rink that has stirred the interest of boys and girls here in local schools to skate. Since opening, an increasing number of pupils have been paying regular visits to the skating rink. A new yoga classroom with trainers will be open next month for mothers with babies. They can bring their own yoga mat and work out together with their babies. This will be a great way for them to get healthy and meet other mums. There will also be a brand new gym open to the pensioners in the near future. Just this month, a new swimming pool is open to all fitness levels with special offers for those without a job. Our complex is open daily from 8 a.m. to 9 p.m., except on Thanksgiving and Christmas. We intend to extend our business in the coming year. A list of equipment will be put up for sale, ranging from exercising equipment like cardio machines to sports recovery and injury prevention facilities. Within our complex, we try our best to avoid injuries of any kind. We train knowledgeable staff to guide our clients through correct workout regimens. For those who want to further ensure workout safety, they are welcome to apply to be a member of our standing committee. They are responsible for revising the safety guidelines and supervising its enforcement. Now, I would like to introduce some of our most popular sports facilities here at Northfield Sports Complex. Our 25 metre swimming pool is the centrepiece of the complex, combining modern, bright and airy surroundings with fully up-to-date changing facilities. The pool is excellent for learning how to swim, improving techniques and, of course, competing in school competitions. It is also bookable for private functions, including pool parties, where lifeguards are available. Next, we have the only climbing wall throughout the whole town. Many would see rock climbing as a type of extreme sport, exposing great risk to those who participate. But actually, under proper guidance and with close supervision by the coach here, it is a perfect sport for the youth to increase their flexibility and strengthen their muscles. I have to mention our skating rink once again. As our most popular facility, it has been prominently featured in a TV commercial we've released recently. There is no other skating rink larger than ours within the whole nation. Also, our state-of-the-art gym is an inspiring place to train and keep fit in relaxed and friendly surroundings. The Techno Gym equipment enables our clients to measure their performance. If you book a one-on-one -on -one trainer, he or she might suggest a future training plan and help you train more systematically. Hello and welcome to today's talk. Here with me is the famous botanist Professor Alison Downing. So, Alison, tell us something about cocoa beans. Cocoa beans, also called cacao beans, are the primary constituent in making chocolate. Grown in tropical areas in South and Central America, West Africa and Asia, the cocoa tree is often raised on small family-owned farms. When the harvested pods are open to expose the beans, the pulp and cocoa seeds are removed and the rind is discarded. The pulp and seeds are then piled in heaps, placed in bins or laid out on grates for several days. During this time, the seeds and pulp undergo a process called sweating, where the thick pulp liquefies as it ferments. The fermented pulp trickles away, leaving cocoa seeds behind to be collected. This is when the beans are harvested and then the bags holding them are ready to be transported. But the most important step in processing the cocoa bean is cleaning it. 
Once the beans are unloaded from the railroad cars, the packages are opened and then weighed by machines. Then the pods are split and the seeds or beans are covered with a sweet white pulp or mucilage. On arrival at the factory, the cocoa beans are sorted and put in a hopper to be cleaned more rigorously. The wet beans are then transported to a facility so they can be fermented and dried. They are fermented for four to seven days and must be mixed every two days. They are dried for five to 14 days, depending on the climate conditions. The fermented beans are dried by spreading them out over a large surface and constantly raking them. Then the beans are ready to be roasted. Now, roasting takes place at a high temperature and then the beans are boiled in a heated chamber. During the roasting process, the beans will be expanded and cracked. But prior to this, the beans are trodden and shuffled about using bare human feet. During this process, red clay mixed with water is sprinkled over the beans to obtain a finer colour, polish and protection against moulds during shipment to factories in the United States, the Netherlands, the United Kingdom and other countries. Now, back to what I was saying. After the beans are cracked, they need to be cooled. Then the roasted beans are sealed in pockets. Wow, that is not a simple process, is it? But someone told me that different roasting levels of coffee can lead to different kinds of flavours. Yes, roasting coffee transforms the chemical and physical properties of green coffee beans into roasted coffee products. The roasting process is what produces the characteristic flavour of coffee by causing the green coffee beans to change in taste. Unroasted beans contain similar if not higher levels of acids, protein, sugars and caffeine as those that have been roasted, but lack the taste of roasted coffee beans due to the Maillard and other chemical reactions that occur during roasting. The vast majority of coffee is roasted commercially on a large scale, but small-scale commercial roasting has grown significantly with the trend toward single-origin coffees served at specialty shops. Some coffee drinkers even roast coffee at home as a hobby in order to both experiment with the flavour profile of the beans and ensure the freshest possible roast. So here, I'm going to introduce some of these roasted coffee beans and their special flavours. Now, the first crack is lighter bodied and has a higher acidity level with no obvious roast flavour and is popular for its special mild taste. This level of roast is ideal for tasting the full original character of the coffee. The green beans are raw, unroasted coffee beans. They are strictly hard beans with a smoky flavour and a slightly acidic. We've also got French roast and the flavour that comes across in French roast coffee usually has more to do with the roasting process than the actual quality of the beans. By the time the beans are dark enough to qualify as French, most of their original flavour has dissipated. In its place come the flavours of caramelising sugar, bittersweet coffee and often a bit of chocolate. And finally, espresso smoky, that is, coffee brewed by forcing a small amount of nearly boiling water under pressure through finely ground coffee beans. Espresso is generally thicker than coffee brewed through other methods, has a higher concentration of suspended and dissolved solids, and has creamer on top. As a result of the pressurised brewing process, the flavours and chemicals in a typical cup of espresso are very concentrated. Espresso is also the base for other drinks, such as café latte, cappuccino, café macchiato, café mocha, flat white or café americano. Today, we're pleased to have on the show Chris Evans from the Royal Caledonian Curling Club. Now, let's welcome Chris to tell us something about ice curling. Chris, please. Thank you. It's my honour to briefly talk about ice curling here to all of you. So let's start with what curling is. Curling is a sport in which players slide stones on an ice rink towards a target area which is segmented into four concentric circles. Two curling teams consist of four players, the lead, the second, the third and finally the skip. 
the captain of the curling team and its players will throw their stones in the order stated above. Each team has eight stones. The purpose is to accumulate the highest score in the game. Points are scored depending on which stone is resting closest to the centre of the target area at the end of the game. The ice surface on which the game is played or the rink in curling is called the sheet. It is covered with tiny droplets of water that become ice and cause the stones to curl or deviate from a straight path. The curling players should slide the heavy polished stones or rocks across the ice curling sheets towards the house, a circular target marked on the ice, as I've mentioned before. There are several pieces of equipment essential for a curling game, so a concise instruction will be given to you. The most important things are the curling brush, which is used to sweep the ice surface in the path of the stone, as well as the curling stone, which is sometimes called rock. The former is usually made of horsehair, and the latter is made of granite, mainly coming from Scotland. Curling shoes are similar to ordinary athletic shoes, except that the two shoes in a pair have dissimilar soles. The sole of the slider shoe, which is designed for the sliding foot, is typically made of Teflon, while the gripper shoe for the hack foot has a special layer of rubber applied to the sole. During the curling game, you may also find a stopwatch attached either to the player's clothing or the broom, which is used to time the stones over a fixed distance to calculate their speed. Now, a word about the development of curling clubs. Curling is thought to have been invented in medieval Scotland, and outdoor curling was very popular in Scotland between the 16th and 19th centuries, as the climates provided good ice conditions every winter. Kilsyth Curling Club is renowned as the first club in the world, having been formally constituted in 1716, and widely influencing ice curling development. In Kilsyth today, both men's and ladies' sections are thriving, participating in all major competitions and having won championships in the British Open in the past. The mother club of curling, Grand Caledonian Curling Club, was instituted in 1838 for the purpose, not as such to attract people's interest, but to regulate the ancient Scottish game of curling by general laws. With these official rules, the young curlers could be trained in a more professional way. By 1842, the new national club had sought to obtain royal patronage, and it has ever since been known as the Royal Caledonian Curling Club. However, many sports, such as athletics and tennis, were frowned upon as being too recreational and not practical enough. So the Crown banned them by law during the 1300s, in the hope that men would instead practice the archery skills that were seen as vital to the country's defence and the ban was lifted in the 17th century. So, do you know the reason for curling being kept during the 16th century? Is it because it was so popular, or because people from all ages like children could play it? The spirit of curling dictates that one never cheers mistakes, misses, or gaffes by one's opponent, and most importantly, all the team members should strictly follow the instructions of their captain, which is essential for men in battle. Curling was brought to Canada from Scotland and some curling was played informally before 1800. Curlers often used iron curling stones made from melted materials such as cannonballs rather than granite until the early 1900s because there were transport problems importing granite stones from Scotland. Hello, I am delighted to welcome you to our mining community and very pleased that you are interested in the ores and pits of this area. I think you'll be pleasantly surprised with your special experience here. Now, let me start by giving you some warnings on safety rules and regulations. Rule number one, always wear safety equipment. There is a litany of safety equipment that mining workers use for their protection, from helmets to safety glasses and gloves. It is essential that all workers wear the necessary safety equipment at all times. There have been countless stories of workers being saved by helmets, which are the hard hats that you can see on the shelf beside you. So, visitors wearing helmets is mandatory in the mining area, although you are free to take them off when you're in the mining museum and picnic area. You won't need to pay any deposit, though you should return them to the counter once you finish the visit. The helmets are offered in all sizes, so choose a suitable one. All right. Our mining community is currently being refurbished for some of the main area, 
so please make a note of that, and you'll know what to look out for. So, when you go in or out of the mine, please pay attention to the road, for it has just been repaired because of the rough surface and can be really slippery since it's still wet. The history and process of tin mining are complicated and involve a lot of special words, but here you will see how it was and still is done. After a short five to ten minute walk, visitors can track round a numbered route with clear explanations. Most of the tour is in the open air, so nice weather helps. All areas are clearly posted with signs, but if you have problems travelling around or climbing up and down, you can turn to the staff here and we are happy to help. If you are interested, Blue Hills Tin Stream is a working water-powered tin streaming mill that gives visitors a very clear idea of how difficult it is to get tin out of rock. I hope you'll enjoy the informative indoor presentation and this self-guided tour, but you have to bear one thing in mind, that smoking is forbidden throughout the whole community. Though you can take phones and of course use them, you'll also be surprised that there will be more than just one place to go in the mine. The underground tunnel is now being refurbished and only relevant workers can access it. But it will soon be all finished and I believe it's a lovely place for you to explore around. Don't forget to wear protective clothing. It's mandatory. Now, let's start by seeing where you can go. As you can see on our map in the brochure I've given you, we are here at the reception block. We have a famous mill which is used for making and processing materials such as steel and coal. To visit it, just go straight ahead, north, along the path in front of you, and you'll find it at the end of the path. Now, towards the east, go along the path from our starting point. Turn left to the corner and then turn right. There is a car park at the east end of the lane. To the west, there is a museum. Pass the shop around the crossroads and it is just located at the west end of the road. And by the way, the shop is specialised in selling a variety of ore-related souvenirs, including key rings, postcards, tin-made Lewis chessmen, and even Roman soldiers which are made from beautiful pyrite. If you are interested in the laboratory where scientific experiments, analyses and research are carried out, it is situated at the southern part of the park, opposite the shop. I bet you'll be happy to hear that this laboratory is also used for gold and crystal refinement, so don't miss this one for the sake of it. I assume by this time you'll all need some rest and refreshment. So we have an excellent cafe which caters for delicious food and beverages at the other side of the road next to the shop. Of course, if you want to spend some time in the fresh air, we have a perfect picnic area which is just right and northeast of the reception block. Further east, there is a path leading to the northern part of the park, and at the end of it is the toilet. Now, most of the visitors would choose to use the mailbox and send the beautiful postcards to their friends. To reach it, just... Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the second annual Wallaby.